this call. All right, welcome everyone. This is uh, this is Daniel Stein, um, one of the founders of uh, Spirits of Change, and we're here on our uh, Friday call, uh, November fifteenth. And let's get technical group. Uh, we've been meeting now for oh gosh, almost somewhere between three and four months. With uh, almost every Friday, we've been getting together to talk about uh, technical things and other kinds of topics. So it's been really fun and exciting to get to meet people from across the country and uh, engage in some real interesting conversation. And uh, today we we are um, uh, designing this. We, we sort of set the agenda for today, uh, which I'll show you. Maybe uh, do, first of all, I'm going to do some quick housekeeping. Um, before I get into the agenda here. So if you're on, you can, uh, it's a good idea to mute yourself um, just so we don't hear what you're ordering for lunch, those kind of things. But um, you can just go ahead and mute yourself and you can unmute at any time. Sometimes background noise is, is loud. If it gets too noisy, I'll just mute everybody and unmute the, the speakers, but it's easier if you mute yourself there. Um, and so uh, I think I mentioned this before, we have in the, in the, um, uh, the, the nav bar up for the Zoom. If you haven't used Zoom before, it's pretty easy. There's a, you can you can uh, ch check uh, click on the uh, on the chat bar, and you'll see that come up on your screen. You can uh, we're going to do that in a minute to introduce people, but you can use that to ask questions or make statements, or um, uh, you can also raise your hand, and you'll see a little icon next to your next to your picture on your on your icon on the screen. Um, you can also see on the participants who's there, and you can keep those screens open on your screen. We don't see them, but it is a good way to kind of see who's involved and see who's talking as well. Um, so uh, the call is recorded like all the other calls, and so they're posted on the Hub uh, within a couple of days so that um, if you miss it, you can watch it, and if, you, if you're new to the call, you can actually uh, binge watch all of them this weekend. So we have we have uh, plenty of uh, plenty of, uh, of uh, material to, to listen to. It's pretty interesting. So as I said, uh, I'm Daniel. Uh, we'll just do some introductions in just a minute here, and I want to spend a little time on some updates on the NIC itself and on um, on on the hub piece. Part of what we want to do today, as a uh, sort of an open house, was to just make sure we took a moment and let people know you know what what's happening, what's, what things are looking like, um, any kind of navigation questions. Uh, there's a lot of activity happening. Which is really cool. And if you have questions or suggestions or ideas, it would be great. We're not gonna spend a whole lot of time on that, but you know, as things come up, it'll be good, hopefully, to, to hear from you if there's something that is um, particularly uh, interesting or useful to, for us to hear. And then we'll, uh, we'll transition over to uh, really the, one of two main sections. One is the the proof of concept project, which uh, we've talked about. You've probably seen some material about. And uh, Dave Walsh, Tom Silvius, and others will be presenting on uh, this very interesting, very uh, 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 touches many domains uh, kind of uh, um, proof of concept that is engaging more people on this call as well. So it's very exciting and it's, it's, a, it's a really great thing that we're able to do. So Dave will lead us through that. And then we have some reactor and responders uh, who uh, are been joining and participating in these calls and have um, a, some perspective from other domains or other programs. When we talk about domains, we talk about six domains that we work in and different programs and agencies and what your perspective is relative to what you're hearing on the proof of concept and then how do we do cross domain, uh, cross sector, horizontal kind of thinking between education and health and human services? How do we, how do we increase that connectivity, that collaboration? A lot of the issues we're all dealing with are, are fairly common. And then we'll do a real quick uh, follow up and a couple of interest, interesting things coming up next. Um, so, but before we get into that, what, we, what we've been doing is just introducing new people to the call um, if, um, if you haven't been here before, uh, the way we do this is you just open up your chat box, put your name in, and I'll call your name and you get to tell us who you are, where you're from, what the weather is like, uh, and, um, and also uh, kind of what you do. And that's been just a nice way of doing it. It's an orderly way of actually calling people uh, uh, to the table. Or if you haven't been here in a while and you want to say hello, remind us, uh, that's awesome as well. 
Um, so now would be the time to go to your chat box and write your name in if you want us if you want a minute to say hello who you are. Who's going to be the first victim? Nobody's okay. So, uh, so I'm going to call on Roger, Mc, Roger, because I know you introduced yourself and you said you were new. <laughs> Thanks. Go ahead. Thanks. Took me a minute to get to the chat box. Yep. Um, so I am. Uh, I work in healthcare information technology. I live in the DC area. Uh, I've been working on government health IT activities across all the various federal agencies. I've also done a fair amount of work in states and communities. Um, I'm technical by nature. I'm an engineer because uh, I've got about 40 years of experience doing this. Um, I was introduced to Stewards of Change and Daniel recently when we were sort of exploring some opportunities um, and this call came up as a part of that. So I thought I would just plug in and see what was going on with this call, see how it works. So I'm looking forward to it. Thanks, Roger. And the weather's great here. It's cold. <laughs> cold and sun is As we were saying, DC is very busy right now with uh, congressional hearings. So, <laughs> well, hopefully like a, little bit of that, a little bit of that hot air will warm up the environment a bit. Nice um, to have you join us, Roger. Thanks, hey. Brian. I guess that's you, huh? Hello. So, um, who else? I know there's some folks on the phone that may not actually have access to chat. So, j jump in if you're new to the call and say hello. Hi, this is Mary Kratz from the Interoperability Institute uh, in Michigan, where it is cold and white. <laughs> Snow has taken over, huh? Welcome. Thank you for joining. Steve Sunken. There we go. Yep. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, yeah, Steve Sunken here. I'm at the uh, Montgomery County uh, Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, we've worked with you folks uh, for a while going back to the implementation of our um, integrated case management system. But obviously, we've got a lot of interest in trying to take data across uh, multiple um, partners in the community. Uh, and so um, that, that's my purpose in being here. I am, as uh, the previous person said, a fairly technical by nature, having uh, been in IT all of my 40 some odd year career. So, um, so I'm interested in understanding how we can actually make these things uh, happen. How we can actually do things. Great. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else want to say hello? Okay. A, uh, I guess we've had a lot of people here before. Okay. So one last thing, if you're on your phone and uh, also your computer, if you uh, want to switch over and just substitute your phone number for your name or your name for your phone number, that would be fantastic. So we see who's on the call. Okay. So we'll, uh, we'll move along here. As I said, it's an open forum uh, to try to jump in, have as much conversation as we can. So what I want to talk about next briefly, is the National Interoperability Collaborative. So um, I, I, I know a number of people have heard me say this before. So um, um, hopefully um, you'll have ideas to add to it or if not, just uh, appreciate it. So uh, the NIC is an outgrowth of work we've been doing for a couple of years with funding from the Kresge Foundation to build a community of networks really across the country, a virtual community. Uh, and the idea has really sprung up. Many of you on the call here are dealing with system inter or uninteroperability and the difficulty of sharing and exchanging information across, even within your own four walls, no less across other programs and agencies. Problem everyone's been dealing with for quite a while. Um, and we've been looking at that as well for ourselves as well. So um, we've always felt like there was such good work going on across the country. And we had the good fortune of being able to bring people together through conferences and some symposium and seminars. But um, the knowledge was, was you know, uh, uh, sort of would vaporize. People would go home, you know, you go to a conference and you, you pick up a couple of things and you go back. But there's no way to really connect effectively with people who were there or with groups of uh, people and organizations that were there. So the underpinning of this is that idea of can we create a virtual water space 
where people who are interested in a variety of topics related to data sharing and interoperability could actually come together in forums just like this we're having today or virtually online, uh, where it's uh, hopefully a very easy to navigate uh, portal where you can learn, you can contribute, you can get in a conversation. And it is um, something that uh, is actually taken off. So we mentioned, or I mentioned earlier, and you can see up here as well, this, this uh, reference to six domains. We had done some work for HIMSS a couple of years ago uh, to try to look at interoperability, both within the healthcare space and more broadly. We ended up really focusing on, uh, on the, the challenges, opportunities, developments, uh, promising practices uh, in multiple areas, including not only human services and public health, but education, public safety, and emergency medical response, and healthcare and IT. Uh, each of those have many areas of overlapping interest and similar challenges, and most importantly, the need to exchange information, sometimes at critical moments, uh, in, a, in a person's life, emergency situations, as well as just regular ongoing um, uh, kind of care and, care and feeding, so to speak. And we recognized that the ability to share that information was difficult and everyone was trying to solve the same problem, essentially, or many of the same problems. So the idea that is underpinning all of this work is how do we facilitate the conversation across the domains? You know, you're all working within your domain to make things better, but how do we do it across I think that's where we get the scalable implementation, scalable change, when we start to connect some of those larger flywheels together. That's the purpose of it. And um, fortunately, we've been able to pursue it. And um, right now we have um, actually uh, close to 1,000 members. And we submitted and was recognized last year as uh, for the website. For the hub is uh, a best in class in several areas, which I hope you'll agree with. And we're really proud to be recognized uh, by the Davies Award for this work. As I said, we launched officially about a year ago. We have about uh, 800 members, eight groups, a lot of resources. People come to the site, they're highly engaged. They're spending time looking at seven, eight pages at a time. Uh, we have uh, uh, lots of visits and visitors and we're approaching 100,000 page views. So, in, you know, from a numbers perspective, it's, it's very gratifying that people are coming, they're consuming, they're, you know, they're connecting with one another. You can see the members online, you can see their, their, your profiles, your backgrounds, your areas of interest. And so, um, it, you know, it's, it, it's moving, right? It's beginning to, it's beginning to work. And um, I think there's kind of a flywheel effect here, whereas the more people get involved and add content and ideas, the more it builds and the more sustainable it becomes from an intellectual perspective. Uh, so hopefully you'll um, uh, take time out of your days and make sort of collaboration a part of your daily practice, which is really the uh, sort of the, the mantra that, that I've used now for a while is, you know, collaboration just doesn't happen on weekends and evenings. That's great for the hackers and the programmers, but for collaboration, it really does, should happen during the day. And when that becomes regular behavior, that would be um, that would be great. Um, so um, let me move forward. Uh, there is a little bit of background noise. Thank you for that. Uh, let me find that five point eight. Hope that is. Um, did we see that there? Or did it change? Sorry. Okay. Um, so uh, the collaboration hub is. Um, I'm just going to go briefly into the hub, uh, and just for to show some people, show folks kind of where we're at on this thing. Uh, there we go. So what you should be seeing on my screen now, and somebody can chat to make sure that you do see it. Uh, is the homepage of the of the uh, of the collaboration hub, and here this is designed really for to bring people into it. There's a top bar navigation with lots of different things to do. Um, um, uh, you know the about my page. There's a form. There's a blog. And well, one of the things we recently did from some feedback was there was a little bit of confusion about if I if you want to publish content, where should you put it? Because there's there's a form. There's a blog. There's different different groups and things like that. So this gives you a little bit of a direction if you want to participate in a conversation. We encourage you to write write blogs, opinions. Um, we've started up 
a project, which we'll be talking about shortly. Uh, within events, there's also places to put material and content. You can post your own event there. It's a very highly trafficked area of the site as well, as well as photos and videos and under the groups themselves. So this is kind of more navigation stuff. And in the body of this thing here, you'll see featured events. Uh, you'll see some highlights. You, we've got today's group up here. We've got what's coming uh, next week. Uh, and then we also have some past featured calls that are uh, hopefully instructive. Some recent blogs uh, and some discussion topics that are going on here. So it's kind of the stuff that needs to pop up to the top is ideally uh, as easily accessible here. One of my favorite parts is the activity feed. You can see who's come in recently. Uh, it's almost real time who signed up. You can go right to them and, and uh, connect with them, and you can go historically back. So as I said, it's fun to see new people joining. Um, the last thing I'll point out here is the, uh, the groups. So there are a number of groups that have formed. The, we're on the Let's Get Technical group. There's one on opioids, social determinants, uh, a HIMSS group, and then two regional chapters, one for New England when we had done some work there last year, and a California. These are both not terribly active at the moment, but um, are, have been in the past involved. Um, um, I'm just gonna mute people as I see them up there. So this is the place where the action is happening. And this is where people are coming together, whether or not we're having webinars, material are being posted, et cetera. And I'm just gonna go one level down and if you click, if you, uh, click through to Let's Get Technical, you, you see kind of a same, similar screen and then right here is really the, where a lot of what's happening uh, is available to you. See the recent and featured calls. So this has a recording of the call. If there's a PowerPoint, if there's materials, you can access that quickly. And, and you'll see we're talking about uh, a variety of topics from uh, uh, public safety to education to uh, some leading uh, efforts around TEFCA and gravity projects. So this is kind of a good compendium of things. Um, you can find all the past calls here. And then on the right side, we have a kind of a, a little manifesto about the Let's Get Technical group, some featured discussion topics. And then here's our project. This is the, this is the project that we're gonna be talking about today, which is the Let's Get Technical. And um, there's a video and then there's project uh, resources that are here. So there's related documents. This will be filled out a bit more. And then there'll be um, background, and then we have to pause that. The great, great interview. If you got time, I'm uh, was interviewed at Hims. It was actually a real wonderful event. But so there's all the content down here as well. So people are adding comments. Uh, we just put up one yesterday, and there's a response. Uh, you can see whether or not there's a response, and you can actually have threaded conversations, which is nice. So if you add a comment, somebody adds another comment to you, and someone adds a third comment. We can kind of track those conversations. Uh, and as the proof of concept gets going, we'll want to be able to do that as well, of course. Uh, so this is a pretty quick overview of that, of what we've got going here. Um, you'll, uh, if you spend a little time on it, it's pretty intuitive from a menu-driven perspective. And you can then uh, actually drive right into the project itself or any one of the other groups and explore, explore, explore. There's a ton of stuff on here to be able to do. So uh, with that, let me just pause for a second and, um, and see if there's anybody has any uh, particular uh, responses or questions or thoughts or recommendations offhand before we move on. It's perfectly fine to say, yes, it's great. It's easy to navigate. I like it. Okay, so I'm gonna take your, your quiet as that this is uh, intuitive and obvious. Um, what I will uh, encourage you to do, and we were just talking about this yesterday itself, was, for, you know, there's the one, uh, I think it's the nine, uh, what is it, the 99 and one um, uh, perspective, which is um, one or 2% of people actually create content, you know, three or four or 5% sort of moderate it, and generally a bulk of people, 90, 95% of people are actually consuming it. What we're trying to do with this group here with Let's Get Technical and the hub is to create more content developers so that we're creating the narrative and we're actually sharing that narrative with ourselves, the people who are joining, 
and with our communities around. And that will give us um, uh, um, a powerful group to learn from and to be able to bring into your own jurisdictions, your own projects. You can almost think of this as an advisory group in, in many ways. Um, and as that becomes more realized, I'm, uh, and I think we're all hoping that that really uh, provides a real meaningful value to the participants in this. So what I'm going to do next, unless there's any comments, and if things come up or ideas pop up, by all means, go ahead and share that. Uh, but what I'm going to do now is I'm going to transition this back to uh, the PowerPoint slides. And I'm going to ask, I think I'm going to ask Dave Walsh to go ahead and take over here. I have a little trouble with my screen. Um, do you see my PowerPoint slides? Yes. What we see right now is the hub in numbers. The hub in numbers. You see the hub in numbers. Okay. Hang on one second. Let me. Oh, yeah, it didn't take that. Um... Yeah, I guess that's the snipping tool. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now you should see the. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Project Unify. Everybody see that on the screen? Great. Terrific. Uh, Dave Walsh, uh, it's over to you now. Okay, sounds good. Uh, again, uh, I know I've introduced myself a couple of times. Uh, name is Dave Walsh. Uh, had been very focused in the Medicaid space for many years now um, and had been involved uh, as others on this call had been. Uh, Susan Fox is on and Tom Silvius as two examples uh, in a group called the MITA TAC or Technical Architecture Committee for MITA. And what we're doing now with Project Unify is looking at what's occurring in the healthcare space. And there's an awful lot of effort uh, going into interoperability in the healthcare space. So we're trying to take lessons learned from that space, approaches, patterns, and so forth, and apply them to human services in general. So the approach that we've taken is really to develop a proof of concept implementation that allows uh, uh, for the education of our people to understand what the technical details are that are needed for interoperability. Now, one of the things that uh, we came to realize a few years ago was that um, uh, much of what we were communicating was technical details. How do we put these systems together? How do we uh, handle authorization or authentication to resources and so forth? And um, uh, the issue that we had was there was no good user story to tell why we're doing these things. So on today's call, we're going to have Tom Silvius for the last two years with the Might Attack. Tom Silvius has uh, really led us in terms of putting together a relevant and understandable user scenario explaining why we're doing this. What problems are we trying to solve? And today, Tom is going to walk through the proof of concept as it exists. And again, the proof of concept is primarily about learning how, or the participants on this group, learning how to implement interoperable solutions and demonstrating what can be accomplished. So um, if you can go to the next slide, Daniel. And while he's doing that, um, uh, so we intend to continue collaborating with the MITE attack even closer. And uh, as I said a moment ago, uh, Tom Silvius, who's going to be talking in a moment, 
um, really got us going down the path of uh, basing it on a user story, telling why we're doing this. Uh, so Tom's going to explain that user story, what, uh, what he did for the last two years um, is a user story where the second year grew upon the first year. So we're taking and progressing this user story. And Tom's going to lead in a conversation about where the next steps are in that user story. And then one of the sets of technology that we've used for the last two years on telling this story was a uh, set of technology called Care Nexus. And Care Nexus originated in the uh, SAMHSA world where uh, SAMHSA funded the project, moved it forward uh, with the company FEI Systems who actually implemented parts of it. Uh, Book Zerman, Brian Book's company is now taking that over and uh, implementing a open source version of this called Care Nexus. And it's really going to be at the core of a care management case management solution that we're going to be using smart interfaces. Smart is an approach to have fire-based uh, uh, applications communicate with each other and handle the security, the authorization, authentication aspects of it. And uh, we're also going to be bringing in MyHIN, the Michigan Health Information Network, who is supplying an infrastructure for fire-based services, uh, something called interoperability land. And Mary's on the call leading the charge for MyHIN. We'll talk to Mary in, in a few moments. Uh, one of the issues that we ran into fairly early on was this uh, topic of cross-domain person sharing or person matching, I'm sorry, uh, which is fundamentally is de-Stein in um, this health record, the same individual as Daniel Stein uh, in this other system. So it's a problem that as we start to look at cross-domain applications, you need to find out whether you're talking about um, the same individual. So we started with a breakout work group to uh, identify what the issues were there. We actually just had a call this morning with a company by the name of Sinseng, who is going to uh, facilitate some APIs for us to do the cross-domain person matching. Uh, the next steps in that independent work group that we've got is to identify what the cross-domain elements are that we're going to be making sure we can match the people across. So it's actually starting to get into implementation times. Um, uh, so uh, the one thing that we want, and I'll pipe down here in a moment, is we're continually asking for volunteers to help with this. And uh, the approach that we've taken is one of cloud-based microservices that uh, is consistent with an initiative called FIRE or Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources and about, uh, allows you to plug in a variety of other capabilities easily with minimal uh, integration necessary. And one of the interesting things was as we had a preparatory call for this call, uh, uh, Eric Zhang uh, reached out to us and said he's got a set of utilities as well that can fit into this proof of concept. And we would ask everybody to do the same thing. Eric is going to give us an overview of what their um, framework is capable of doing. And we're 
looking for other individuals who have um, frameworks that can help in this process or subject matter experts or um, uh, technical people to actually implement in some of the coding. We're looking for volunteers to help us. So even as we start to walk through today's session, love to have people just reach out and say, hey, we've got something that we could bring to the party, some skills, some talent, a framework. Uh, so want it to be a very interactive session. Daniel, can you go to the next slide? Yeah, and um, I think that one of the things, oops, here it goes. There you go, good, I'll, I'll comment later. Okay, so, um, just broadly speaking, what we're looking at initially is a, uh, a user experience, something that can allow people to actually see this proof of concept at work. We're trying to focus initially on uh, uh, patient provider access to these resources individuals. So. One of the focuses is going to be to make sure that it can run on iOS devices, Android, desktops, browsers, and so forth, a means by which we could access these various resources. Uh, Daniel, next, next slide. So, uh, this is just very, very big picture on the top. We've got the various uh, domains or resources that we're gonna be talking to. We're gonna be using uh, APIs, the smart APIs, which consist of OAuth2 and other industry standards to allow us to communicate with these resources. And without saying a great deal more, what I'd like to do is open the conversation and turn it over to Tom Silvius. Again, Tom is the individual who has been crafting the user story uh, over the last two years, and we've asked him to help us as we move forward with the user story that brings together these other domains. So Daniel, if you could go to Tom's first slide. Yeah, let me just, uh, let me just pause there for a second um, before I hand it off to Tom, to, to Tom here. You know, one of, the, one of the challenges, the most exciting things and one of the challenges is to actually have a technical conversation. Everybody's at a slightly different or a, potentially a substan substantively different place in that conversation. So um, one, of the, uh, one of the things we'd like to make sure we do is if you're hearing whether or not acronyms or concepts uh, that you don't understand um, or are new to you, uh, it's a good idea to sort of raise your hand, put a comment or ask for some clarification. Because my guess is if you're not understanding some stuff, uh, there are other people out there as well. Now, obviously we can't do that you know, all the time for everything, but I think some major things we should really be focusing on that. So you're, that you're sort of part of it uh, and that we're learning from it in terms of, um, you know, in terms of some of the terminology, some of the areas we're going towards. Although we do want to take it obviously technical, uh, we do want to encourage people to, you know, uh, ask for clarification and to offer ideas about things that might, might, might make it more, might make more clear as well. So before we go on, is, any, is there any questions out there? for instance, on FIRE or SMART or OAuth or anything like that? Okay, so Tom, you're up then. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Daniel. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and just uh, for those of you who don't uh, know me, my name is Tom Silvius. I am uh, the director of uh, strategic business initiatives at uh, General Dynamics for our uh, state and local business. Uh, I've been in the health and human services arena for probably close to 35 years now. Um, and um, so, and as uh, Dave mentioned, you know, a couple of, of this kind of goes back to uh, what we started doing in the MITA attack around the uh, the Medicaid uh, presentations for the Medicaid Enterprise 
Systems Conference, which many of you on the phone probably go to. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, so what we've done, um, what I'm about to talk to you about is uh, is a proposal. Um, it's not uh, cast in stone by any standard. In fact, uh, we'd like to invite some interaction to sort of um, change it up to make it relevant to the audiences, um, make sure that we have important concepts represented. Um, what this is ultimately going to wind up being is sort of a scope of interactions. Um, and we'll see that here in a little bit, um, where data exchanges occur uh, to achieve an outcome. And so what we're going to try to show you now is uh, a, I'll call it a pseudo-realistic um, uh, user scenario um, where uh, people um, are a benefit from these interoperability scenarios uh, rather than just making it a purely technical exercise. Um, and uh, I would like to thank um, the folks at the Michigan Health Information Network uh, with the um, uh, their um, uh, fire pits with the um, uh, interoperability test beds where they have curated uh, some clinically relevant um, uh, basically pseudo, uh, fake data um, which we've been building on for the last couple of years, and we thought it would be helpful uh, for this scenario to continue to build on that story. Um, two years ago, we uh, we were focused on um, the, uh, as Dave was talking about, the smart on fire, uh, the ability to put um, uh, uh, akin to some of the stuff that CMS was putting out around um, uh, putting the patient at the center of their health care, um, being able to, uh, for the patient to be able to consent to share information in a context that was, that included both clinical scenarios and substance abuse, um, mainly because of the, um, some of you are aware of the special requirements uh, for consent to sharing um, uh, substance abuse data. Um, and we had a set of, uh, so we had a set of patients and a set of care teams that were caring for those patients and they were exchanging data uh, using Smart on Fire apps. Um, that was the first demonstration. And then the subsequent year, we, we expanded on that same set of patients um, uh, addressing uh, more of a uh, expanding into uh, more of a social determinants of health realm. Uh, where not only were we uh, exchanging uh, data in a clinical context, but also uh, addressing um, uh, some social determinants issues, such as uh, um, uh, food insecurity, um, housing, uh, some of those uh, basic issues. There was still all exchanges in Smart on Fire. Um, this year, um, and bringing this into the National Interoperability Collaborative, uh, as some of you who've been on the calls previously, um, <clears throat> our interest this year is to try to expand more into the type of cross-domain exchanges. Um, <clears throat> and so we have started to evolve our uh, characters and the situations that they're in and uh, the actions that can be taken uh, by these uh, the care teams involved here to basically do data exchanges now not only with fire but also with uh, need um, and so what you'll see as we go through here uh, is that we've uh, crafted the story in such a way that the interactions now include uh, both uh, fire-based interchanges and meme-based interchanges because of where the data is going. Um, so um, let me just, I, I could, 
stop here and ask for questions, or I could uh, just go ahead and, and go into the story as you prefer. Does anybody have a specific question at the moment? I think doing a quick snapshot of the story would be very helpful, Tom. Okay. Very well. You know, the whole, it's the whole picture. Big overview. Yes. <clears throat> yes. So, so what we have, um, as you can see on your screen, um, we have a, uh, a family, a uh, single parent family who has multiple needs. Uh, we have uh, Sarah Thompson, uh, a divorced mother. Um, she, her son, Jameson, uh, is now eight years old. Uh, he's been uh, growing up as we've been going through this. <laughs> um, and um, poor kid's been through a lot. Um, he's, um, you know, one of the social determinants issues that uh, we were addressing uh, was specifically around adverse childhood experiences uh, that come from uh, uh, things like opioid addictions. And uh, so uh, last year, Sarah was pregnant, um, and now she's basically had a new baby. Um, uh, last year, Jameson basically wound up in foster care uh, due to a child protective case. Um, and now his uh, now that his mother has a new baby, um, they're going to try to reunify the family. Now, as you, many of you know, uh, that's not exactly always straightforward. And uh, she is in court-ordered medication-assisted therapy. So um, the in this story, basically, is what we're going to show, what we're going to use is uh, where the social worker um, is going to uh, basically report back to the courts on her progress against uh, the set of things that she has to do in order to reunify her family. Um, that's kind of the use, use case in a nutshell, and we'll go into a little more detail in, in, in a bit. Um, any questions at this point? You know, what? just one point of, uh, of reference is next week, uh, we'll have a presentation on the, uh, the, uh, the new Family Prevention Act out of the Administration for Children and Families, which has a uh, new, you know, sort of regulatory impact on prevention, substance abuse, things like that. So as we move forward into this, uh, we may want to take another, another uh, look at it to see if there's ways that we can actually tune it so it's in sync with that new legislation, which is been a long, long time coming, so it, it really does uh, harmonize with what's going on there. Right, and that's that's a great thing about the the user story. At this point, we can um, basically on paper we can uh, add things and take things out as necessary in order to uh, you know achieve a certain uh, set of utility that we want to show. Uh, and actually, we you'll see we called an audible even last night <laughs> um, on uh, piece to to add. So that's where we want we want to encourage folks uh, to look at the story, interact with it. Um, uh, it's actually posted on the Nick Hub uh, under this uh, Let's Get Technical group, and um, encourage you to go out and and kind of look at it and think about it and offer. Uh, suggestions as to is this the story we want to show or how would we uh, recommend that we change it. We've been doing things like that since the beginning. I mean, the reason that this um, uh, these patients live in Temperance, Michigan uh, is on purpose, um, actually partly because of the uh, uh, Mayan interoperability, but uh, we we wanted a scenario at the time uh, where um, the, the mother had court-ordered uh, medication-assisted therapy from an out-of-state provider. So we had to find a place uh, where it was closer to an out-of-state provider than an in-state provider, and that's how we landed in Temperance, Michigan. So 
anyway, it's stuff like that that uh, we have done to tweak this as we go along to uh, to make uh, the story relevant, and so we encourage that input from the group. Um, so uh, let's go ahead to the next time. Tom, I'd be I'd be interested to see if anyone's sitting out there saying, "Oh my God, you should really add X or Y piece into this," or it's really of interest to me. Um, um, so I, you know, if anyone is thinking that, uh, I know we just got to vote for temperance is cool. Um, yeah, this this is Roger. So I was just wondering. Um, so when you're trying to bring together all the elements of the social determinants of health, what drives that? Is it just people's experience in specific situations, or do you have interactions with like social workers and people who are on the ground trying to deal with these people who have multiple issues? Yeah, I would say that we're trying to show that, um, you know, to make this feel relevant to useful scenarios, right, and, and actually impactful scenarios. So um, with respect to, um, you know, social determinants, um, you know, a lot of the um, – uh, a lot is being made. It's actually a very timely topic around focus on social determinants and getting – uh, interoperability into the hands of social workers and school nurses and and uh, people like that who have traditionally been kind of behind the curve on uh, this kind of interoperability. Um, you know, CMS wants that, and so one of the things that that we've been doing is trying to show people that you can do this, and here's how. So it's more though than a techni technical thing. You are interacting with social welfare workers and um, other uh, other people who are doing um, aspects of trying to help these people out. Well, and I think yeah. a very important aspect is that, as um, in the scenario, as the individuals contact the different uh, sources of service or not service, like police and court. Uh, medical and human services that each one of those interactions calls for some kind of identification name match and different technology and so these scenarios are important because that's where we're we're bumping up against the issues of meme versus fire and other related problems to solve This is Marcelie. I'm curious about your interaction with the schools, the school nurses or counselors. Any insights? So, Marcelie, this is Dave. Uh, I would just say ideas like that is what we're fishing for. We're looking for people to say, yeah. Of it. Awesome. Um, yes, we, I would love to be a part of that. That's Love that. Love that. One quick thought. Um, this is Adam Pertman uh, with Stewards. One quick thought is it might be fun is the wrong word. <clears throat> Excuse me. To throw in a little curveball where she can't get something or is derailed because she's met, the wrong person is identified, or she can be identified as the right person. You mean on the identity matching part? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that, you know, we can demonstrate the, the problem, a problem, um, if, uh, if identity matching, uh, you know, can thwart you. Exactly. Right. I think it's a great example. Yeah, okay, good. Um, the everyday <clears throat> experience is actually the everyday experience because the education interoperability issues run on either CEDS or IMS Global or just another structure or format. So mapping that out with metadata tags, I think would be helpful for everybody. Right. So would we characterize, uh, would you want to characterize a scenario that where, uh, say, either Sarah or Jameson, her son, uh, is identified as false positive or as false negative? Or both. Mm -hmm is when it's a parent rather than a foster youth. So in, in the, with mm -hmm. foster youth, I know in some states, they have a pretty good system in place to be able to manage the consent mechanisms. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it's rare, but there are a couple of good examples. But what's very hard is when you actually have to obtain either student 
or parent permission um, and what that looks like. So I think that would be the most valuable for everyone. Okay, very good. Uh, Tom, one other so thing. I'm, I'm actually jotting some notes here, and I'll um, and you know we'll take these yep. kinds of feedback yep. and basically uh, adjust as as Daniel mentioned. We'll uh, you know do some tuning on use case and over a couple of iterations. I think we should be able to be in a position where it's it's has the elements that we want in it. Uh, Tom, just two two th two quick thoughts. One is uh, uh, Christine mentioned uh, McV. Uh, program, early home visiting programs and WIC programs, which might be interesting since we know that uh, at the federal administration level, they're looking to try to figure out more interoperability and st data standards approaches to home visiting across the nation under the McVie program uh, and early, early childhood education. So, um, the, the, you know, we've got a lot of pieces here, but those are, those are actually strategically important and probably also relate to the Family First program as well. So, a lot of right. meeting, at least acknowledging that there are other connecting points here that are important. Yeah, and we had kind of gone down, we had started down the path of um, last year around um, uh, having home visits subject to electronic visit verification. Um, but as, as we've seen in these proofs of concept, um, you know, oft, sometimes we start out with uh, more than we can chew. Sure. So um, one of the things that will probably happen as we go through this is, um, you know, we'll, uh, certain of the exchanges will actually show in the proof of concept and then certain others of them will sort of stipulate to, as in, um, you know, kind of like uh, I would liken it to a cooking show. Where you uh, you know you mix some ingredients and then you put it in the oven and then you pull out pull it out of the right. oven already baked, <laughs> right. Right. Um, and um, you know so so that was that's kind of one of the other things that we've tried to do is to sort of um, stay off of the what I'll call the beaten path um, of you know everybody and their uncle can search provider directories these days so you know when it comes to those elements of the story we've been sort of stipulating to those things yeah. um, and and kind of trying to focus in on this the interactions that are net new um, <clears throat> and so you'll see some of that in here that uh, you know some of these things are uh, have been done, have been shown previously um, or are well known to everyone so uh, so we're trying to just hone in on the uh, the net new stuff. Does that make sense? Yep. 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 Yeah. So uh, yeah, we, we're not going to we're not going to get it all done here, but that's another reason for the the hub and the and the you know the website is to be able to if you don't see what or if you're thinking about things, you can add that later. We can be sort of massaging it as we go forward. So um, right. So that will be a yeah. sort of iterative process there. So. Um, so basically, um, I'm uh, kind of short on time now. So uh, I think what I'll do is uh, I'll kind of hit each of these next couple of slides at a high level and encourage you to go into the NIC um, hub and interact with a lot of the details. Um, suffice to say, um, the narrative that we've established at the moment um, is trying to show how clinical care teams, behavioral health, uh, case workers, community-based organizations, courts, and them can use what, what we're, where, we've, where we've tentatively landed, I guess, or what we're, I guess what we've suggested is some sort of smart on fire uh, based interoperability that can be multilingual in that it can do fire-based exchanges and it can also do mean-based exchanges. Um, and from a user story perspective, uh, we have three basic objectives. Um, since, as we mentioned earlier, the whole point to this is reunification of Sarah with her family, um, which means then basically there are certain actions that have to occur to keep Sarah on her path to recovery and basically allow her to create the conditions 
for her son to return home. Um, the um, last year we had a uh, uh, she had an asthma condition. We had a home visit as part of the, the social determinants thing, but we we basically found her a new place to live um, using some analytics. Um, uh, John Odden's group and them had uh, had shown us some analytics that would help find uh, a neighborhood for her to live in that was a little more um, palatable to her asthma uh, and to try to prevent asthma from the children. Um, and she has new digs, but before her kids come home, the, the idea is that she would um, they, that her new apartment um, in a new neighborhood uh, is suitable for the kids and doesn't present a uh, an issue relative to um, uh, you know leaving them vulnerable to asthma development. Also, Jameson um, before, um, and, and I glossed over this point earlier. It turns out uh, Jameson was the reason he's in foster care in the first place is because he was caught, he showed up at school um, uh, basically drowsy, he went to the school nurse, the school nurse found out that he was taking his mother's buprenorphine, which is the medication assisted treatment for her opioids. And so now basically last year he was placed in child protective um, in foster care um, and actually enrolled in a Medicaid waiver program for uh, substance abuse. And so that situation needs to be resolved as well um, for this reunification. That's kind of how the this uh, uh, behavioral health uh, caseworker and all that um, uh, became involved. So, <clears throat> hey, so um, Tom, basically... Tom, 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 let me jump in one mm -hmm. more second, and then I'll hand this back to you here. Um, one of the things I, I, I would like us also to think about as well, especially since we're in the foster care world, and I know some of the people on the call here are from the nonprofit foster care agency world, and they're always struggling to figure out how, because they're the front line, they're doing the work, you know, interacting with families, collecting information, having to report it up and through the, uh, the existing systems. So we want to just make sure as you talk about, you know, uh, at least if we don't get into the detail of at least highlighting what the role of the private foster care agency is, which in many of these areas, whether or not it's behavioral health or foster care or, or home visiting or child, early childhood is all delivered through the nonprofit community. So it's that last mile that's really important for us to be, we not, may not tackle it this time here, but we should be totally aware of it because in many places that's who's really delivering the service. Um, so um, right. I just wanted to call that out as well. Right. Okay. And so uh, I'm not going to go over these uh, bullets here. Uh, you can read them uh, on your own. But suffice to say, uh, six months previously uh, to, to the current <coughs> time, um, basically Gerald, who's the caseworker, had to uh, owes the court a report out on these things that were assigned to Sarah as part of reunification of her family. Um, she had to get her new baby into the first 1,000 days program. Um, you know, they needed to order a uh, asthma home visit, et cetera. Um, so these are the things that they're tracking to and they need to report on progress against, which sets the stage for the, uh, the NEEM part of the uh, interchange. Um, as I mentioned, I, I won't go through this in detail, but I encourage you to go read it and offer your uh, input on it. But suffice to say, um, along those lines then, um, if this is kind of our story, then the set of interactions uh, that basically bring the story about uh, involve um, the notion of a uh, a NEEM uh, case plan, and I'm sure somewhere we'll find the XML schema for that. Um, and basically, 
Um, so what this chart shows you is where uh, what the uh, what the activity is, uh, where it's going from and to, and what's going over the wire. So uh, in the first case, uh, Gerald's filing a case plan with the court that's a meme interaction, and I've also uh, suggested here a um, the restful, if you will, act, action. Um, for that data, um, which is also changeable. Uh, like, for example, you know, if we're if the right, right interoperability is a put rather than a post, then we can change those things. Uh, I'm sure the technical folks on the call will jump in and want to change that around. Uh, but it's there uh, to, uh, to consider critically. Um, so now on the next one, on um, Gerald copying, uh, Risa, what I didn't, um, I'm sorry, if we go back for a second. Um, one of the things that I'd like someone to kind of think about and weigh in on, on this second uh, activity here, uh, one of the characters that I didn't introduce is um, <clears throat> Risa Shah, who is the uh, care coordinator in Sarah's primary care practice. Um, she's the one that basically is is coordinating all these things, like getting her Medicaid, SNAP, WIC, all these other programs. Um, um, she gets a copy of this case plan, and this is going from a uh, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services case management system to the uh, FPFE stands for Five Points Family Practice, which you'll see in the narrative, um, to the EMR at Five Points Family Practice. So we need to consider that interaction as whether uh, this is one of those things where NEEM crosses over to FIRE. And so we need to consider, do we need to convert that or can it be done? Uh, this is kind of one of the core elements of the proof of concept is what has to happen for such things to occur. So there are several of these here. Uh, I encourage you again to uh, go look at them and consider them critically. We can move ahead to the next slide here. And so this is sort of a, a summary of the interactions um, that's also in the document. Uh, it's a little bit easier to consume than the table um, and kind of shows you uh, the various um, interoperability activities that need to occur. Um, and you can see um, basically the two core systems that are involved here is the case management system that the social worker has and the uh, EMR and tool called uh, Omnibus Care Plan, which actually uh, uh, Book Zerman has a variant of that we've been using called Care Nexus. Uh, and this is the uh, genesis of the smart on fire stuff. Um, so you can see that basically what we've concocted here is a scenario that allows uh, fire interoperability to get certain activities done, like a home visit, um, like the um, uh, the doula that um, uh, Sarah had to sign up for to basically figure out how to care for her new baby, things like that. Um, so those services are being ordered and uh, progress against their, uh, the care plan that Risa has is being updated uh, as those activities occur. That's consistent with last year's um, uh, demonstration. And then the new part is where subsequently then these NEEM interactions to file a case plan with the courts uh, then comes into play. So what we're hoping is from a single smart based uh, environment that we can be multilingual in both prior and mean. Does that make sense? It's wonderful. Tom, that's, at this that's, point, I'll, I'll stop and take questions at this point. I think that's the holy grail in many ways is that you know, a lot of this started back when, when we were talking about NEEM and FIRE and standards and WIFE and uh, EDPI and those things, how do they actually interact with one another? So, Yeah, 
and actually, uh, the yellow part, I should I should mention the highlight there. Um, I didn't have time to change the drawing last night, but we came across a uh, another, this is kind of an example of how these things morph over time. Um, one of the suggestions that we got was not just fire and neem-based interoperability, but also third-party uh, access to third-party data through APIs. And... Um, uh, I don't know if uh, Naresh is on the call, but uh, basically we uh, we got a line on uh, such an API to access uh, uh, prescription drug data, which is very consistent with this scenario because one of the things that goes along with this reporting to the court is that Sarah has to um, stay clean um, and um, you know, so having an act, having access to third-party data source enhances the interoperability scenario, gives us more multilingual uh, capabilities, and also is consistent with the user story in that um, uh, you know they they definitely need this information to make sure that she's not being prescribed opioids if she winds up in the hospital or or that um, uh, you know she's on her regimen. Uh, to uh, uh, reunify with her family. Yeah. Hey, now, Rash, you want to say a, you want to say a few words? That, this really came yeah. up yesterday. It's a great example of. Sure. You know, yeah. Uh, so uh, basically, what, uh, how you could think about this is uh, introduce I, yourself first. Yeah. So uh, I'm Naresh, and I'm a senior health informaticist at uh, uh, Utah PDMP, right. and. Uh, We've been working on certain proof of concept patient matching and et cetera. And uh, in our uh, discussion yesterday, we were discussing more about having a RX chip check hub, which is a, a federally uh, initiated program, open source RX check hub, which could uh, act as a point of uh, insertion in this use case. And uh, currently they are uh, creating fire apps for integration. So that's one area where we could use this connection established. Yeah, and that's that's good news, Naresh. And the other thing I wanted to mention here is that um, you know also thanks to uh, the folks at Myhin, the Book Sermon guys, the folks at SAMHSA, a bunch of other folks that have kind of collaborated over the last couple of years to curate uh, some clinically relevant data associated with this scenario. Um, like, for example, uh, my HIN um, uh, test bed data, we have curated a set of meds for Sarah based on her medically complex condition. So she's, um, uh, she also, not only does she have asthma, but she also has uh, um, renal disease. Um, and so that was kind of a complicating scenario uh, for what she can be taking. Um, and but all those meds and everything are already attached to her um, in her uh, plan of care and also in um, some of the uh, clinical in the quote unquote health record that has been established uh, that you can pull up with the uh, PMR. So uh, one of the things that we'd want to do in this proof of concept is see how we can get you to that data. Uh, Naresh, either as uh, by way of you being able to connect my in and get the data, or by basically giving you the information and putting and you can put it in your database or what have you. But um, uh, either way, you know whatever works for the proof of concept. Sure. So. Um, we can have some open conversation now. I know some people uh, are uh, anxious to sort of uh, add in some comments here. So I, I might, Eric, if you're still here, you want to talk a little bit about uh, what we talked about yesterday? Oh, and sure, you... sure, Daniel. Okay. I'm uh, Eric Yan uh, with, I'm the CTO of Alexandria Consulting. And when I first heard about, you know, I've been participating in the NIC uh, pretty close to since the beginning, but when I heard about the Project Unify, uh, idea i thought wow this is ambitious even though you know the the we're limiting it to us you know small use cases at first you know the practical implications of this is it's going to require 
flexible systems. It's going to require transparent systems so we can see what's going on under the hood. Uh, you know, we need to be able to examine these systems. And I thought about, well, what, what systems out there would, would permit that kind of uh, transparency? And um, there aren't many in the human services world. In the healthcare world, uh, you know, uh, Naresh just mentioned one component, and there, there are other, uh, in Brian Bookman's book, Sermon, it's another one that's been mentioned. But in the human services large uh, community, there are not, um, there's a dearth of open source software, especially frameworks that are large. There might be utilities and such. And so uh, one thing that, that I've been working on since 2015 is a framework, a data-centric framework for uh, human services records um, of any type except clinical. We really stay out of that area since it's well-served, uh, even you know if you include the proprietary uh, offerings as well as the open source ones as well. But I've got um, a proposal for Project Unified to cover uh, a framework for the non-clinical and the non, uh, um, well, some of the, uh, the existing systems that you might be connecting to, such as the court case management by him is already covered, but to cover uh, areas of housing uh, or other areas of the social determinants of health, you might need a more uh, a flexible generalist uh, uh, community information exchange. And so I wanted to um, make a proposal to Unify Group. Um, can you uh, advance the slide? Uh, to the, um, I submitted some slides right before this meeting to the team. Uh, and uh, HS Link is, is this project I've been working on. It's a data centric uh, hub. It doesn't have a user interface. That <laughs> It has an administrative user interface, but the idea here is that um, it's it's a uh, community information exchange. And what I think we would be able to use it for if we dedicated some resources to this project is to implement the fire and uh, other mean protocols required to move data from uh, say Department of Housing and Urban Development data sets, which is what HSLink was originally uh, built for, but we've been broadening out into other areas. I don't really want to go into too depth on these uh, slides, um, but um, if you could advance it uh, one more. Um, uh, it's, it's really just a set of cloud microservices, kind of along the lines, I think Dave was mentioning, David Walsh was mentioning earlier that, you know, microservices seem to be the architecture that people are using and they all just communicate with each other as uh, RESTful APIs. All of these are open source. I've got the code uh, online and then they're secured on the cloud where they, where they run. And then it all syncs to a big data warehouse so you can use you know, commercial off the shelf um, analytic tools. Um, can you advance it uh, one more slide, please? Is that uh, Daniel? Thanks. So these are an example of the, some of the microservices. I don't wanna go into too much detail on it, but the idea is that it's really all about the data. Uh, securing the data, securing access control to the data, putting the data into buckets of project groups that may overlap, uh, depending on the project, uh, APIs for client search, you know, you have to have layered on top of even a data lake, you need to have layered on top of it, release of information, client consent, other uh, accountability and logging measures. And um, you need a master patient index in the middle to dedupe all this. Now, a lot, I, I'm sure uh, some of the other open source systems have this, but it's very rare for there to be something that, um, that would be open source that has all these features in it. It's, it, it's, uh, and so I thought perhaps uh, what I've been working on and using in the HUD domain might be of interest. Another thing is a lot of these workflows that Tom was just showing, uh, you know, they, they require, uh, you know, real time event processing. And so you're going to need some sort of push notification or publish subscribe uh, methodologies. And um, um, I just think that, um, uh, I would just like to volunteer HSLink to be, if you need a general um, platform uh, for, for either being um, at the center of a clearinghouse of exchanges or to handle non-clinical or non-court related um, uh, data sets. The data lake we implemented is uh, the Apache Projects Marmata, which uses W3C link data. Well, that could be that could be, and sorry to get technical here, but that could be some of the formats that Neem uses, such as JSON link data um, and uh, RDF. Uh, I, I know that, you know, that's a type of XML and, and um, um, a format for it. And I know that Neem, you know, is heavily uh, 
at least in a legacy format, uh, very, you know, XML schema based, but, um, you know, restful, restful web interfaces is I think the way to go with all this. And I just want to put it out there that, um, I think this project might be a great, um, way to have a transparent system where you can do, uh, uh, non-clinical, uh, human services exchanges uh, and implement the uh, smart on fire um, um, methods uh, or directly implement the fire APIs and or any kind of NEMA EPDs that, that exist. So um, I won't bore you with too much. I had one more uh, kind of diagram slide, but it's it's not real. You can advance it. But it just shows our pub sub framework and and uh, not going to go into that. But uh, just thank you for letting me present. I know the, the context of this was to to have um, you know people chime in with their thoughts on on other tool sets, other uh, resources that we might be able to uh, bring to the unified table. And so I just want to put mine on the table as well. Thank you. Any uh, questions? No, just to thank comment, you so much. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to thank you so much for making it open source so people have the option to build on it. That's really incredibly useful. Thank you. It was incredibly difficult convincing our investors that it was a good idea. <laughs> so <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> I'll bet. I think uh, what was really fascinating to me is on a previous conversation. Uh, when we were talking about Project Unify and to the point of the question that was asked earlier about uh, integration versus interoperability, I think the approach that we're taking is to uh, focus more on interoperability, a lot more on interoperability so that people like Eric, when he sees what we're doing can say, hey, I can bring my framework into this party as well and fulfill certain requirements. So just putting together the pieces from an interoperable perspective makes an awful lot of sense to be able to have the project grow with new capabilities. Maybe some of those capabilities are gonna be specific to a particular uh, issue, maybe some of them are going to be general. And just to, to note again, we have already started taking um, the initial work group for cross-domain person matching into a proof of concept implementation. And we'll give you updates on that. Again, I think one of the things that I'm taking away from this is that periodically we should probably jump back to the basics and just spend about five minutes saying, here's fundamentally what we're trying to do so that new people on the call will understand the underlying uh, initiatives that we're trying to address. So go ahead, Daniel. Well, thanks. Yeah, no, I, I think um, I think that's right. It, it's always a you know challenge to sort of align people's level. Uh, it is the let's get technical group, so we do want to make sure that you know what we've heard over the months and leading up to this was you know a real hunger to kind of get into the weeds, right? Um, for people who may or may not have that opportunity on a you know on uh, on these kind of settings. So um, I think that's fine. I think that's actually good if people are particularly sitting on on technical questions. So, certainly a learning edge for me as well. I'm particularly interested in the NEEM and FIRE uh, conversation and how those things exchange, uh, how, how they're both used and, and sort of live in the same environment given everything that's going on now um, with, uh, with social determinants and the work that's going on in the, uh, the SIREN project and other things like that. Uh, and I was actually gonna call on Paul and see if you had any particular thoughts on that as you're hearing how these things uh, cohabitate, so to speak. If not, that's fine too. <clears throat> Seems the uh, uh, open uh, uh, software process is, uh, lends itself to much greater flexibility in the future. I think the whole yeah, idea actually, of yeah. using microservices. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I, uh, I think the whole. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say um, one of the 
things that we've attempted to lace through the story here in, in this proof of concept is that this is not throwaway work. This is actually a building block that once it works uh, can be applied in any number of scenarios. Um, once the um, you have a um, a um, <clears throat> what well, used to be a smart on fire app and now you have something that works regardless of whether your interactions are fire or neem uh, you can imagine how useful that would be to be applied in any number of future scenarios I think this whole architecture does define a way to look at the problem of interconnecting fire and, and neem uh, I think it's important to remember that NEEM is strictly about semantic interoperability and doesn't deal with the communications issues, which some of these microservices that Eric's talking about are actually a really a good framework for solving that problem and putting the connection between Smart on Fire and, and NEEM in a, in a systems context. So I like this whole approach a lot. Right, and I think, you know, as you're talking, one of the things that's occurring to me, what's getting me really excited here is it, it becomes a, almost a demonstrable visualization of the whole idea of six domains or multiple domains, right? We can talk about it, but here we're actually starting to look at where those things do connect, you know, whether or not it's social and human services to education, to public health, to emergency. We're now beginning to delineate that in a way that you can actually see how those things can and ought to and should and could connect to one another, which uh, is, you know, our holy grail in terms of being able to do that. Um, so, um, so I think that's a, uh, you know, the, the, the process is actually uh, fulfilling sort of the overall goal and mission here um, to, uh, to really elucidate those, those kind of connections and combinations. Um, we just have a few minutes left. I, I do want to make sure that if people have uh, comments, questions, and or um, other thoughts that would be great. The floor is open now for sure. If you want to make comment or ask a question, then we can just move on. Um, so, uh, Mary Sarah, I, I know that you're, I'm not sure if you're on a phone or not, but I, I'd love to hear just a second about what's going on in Sonoma with Fire and Neem, if you have a moment. Um, sure, so um, we've leveraged uh, both Fire and Neem to um, be able to integrate um, the Department of Health um, with this at, at the county level with um, the state programs and uh, corrections. Uh, and the original use case that they were focusing on was um, uh, due to the homelessness that arose from vulnerable persons essentially um, falling off the edge, becoming homeless uh, due to the wildfires. And so um, we stood up a solution very quickly, 90 days, um, that provided a shared dashboard. So they have uh, a shared case plan, if you will, for the individuals across the uh, interdepartmental inter multidisciplinary teams is what they call them. They used multidisciplinary teams before this, but not interdepartmental multidisciplinary teams. So they also had to create new business models um, to support this. Now they're looking at trying to be able to pull in all of the um, county-based um, all of the uh, community-based organizations. And there's not really a good way to refer um, into the county or the county out. And so the idea is going to be to use Fire and Neem to create um, uh, almost like a brokering service uh, through the 211, Sonoma 211, um, that will allow both the sharing of the the client's record based upon consent, so it'll have full access controls with that. And based on that, um, they'll have a shared client file with 
all of the community-based organizations that are contracted with the state or with the county, sorry, and there will be cross-referrals, so the CBOs into the county and the county to the CBOs that will be, instead of open-ended referrals, closed links. So the referrals will go to the providers, not just to the, um, to the clients. The Holy Grail, the last mile, excellent. That would be wonderful to watch and hear how that goes. Thank yeah, you that. sure. Um, uh, so anyway, we're, does that, uh, yeah, go ahead. Does, does that include the mental health referrals? It does, yes. That's amazing, that is so amazing, thank you. Sure. All right, well, we're approaching, uh, actually, you did have another slide there. Um, so we're, we're approaching the, uh, the end of our call today, which uh, I want to thank the presenters and participants for that. They said this will be posted. Uh, just a couple, of, uh, a couple of notes. One thing is, um, you know, people who do want to participate in this process, um, please, uh, please let us know. You can reach uh, Dave or myself or anyone uh, either directly through the emails that you have or uh, through the meeting notification or on the hub itself, all the members are listed there. So you can actually find somebody uh, on, the, on the hub and just uh, email them. But it's a good time to, if you have some time to roll up your sleeves, the, the project team will be uh, scheduling more t regular time to be a meeting. And some of this, you know, this is just kind of a distillation of uh, a lot of efforts that's been going on in the last couple of months. I think that we'll have a more, um, a more uh, focused, uh, a more um, uh, sort of predictable uh, game plan going forward over the next number of months as the project plan sets out. So there'll be a time frame. there'll be some milestones, there'll be people who are part of the team. Hopefully we'll be able to capture and share that on the, on the hub, on the project within the hub itself. And when you're on the hub, you just have to check, uh, check on project. Um, and, then, um, and then that will you know, we'll be periodically reporting that and we'll be periodically offering you know, opportunities to go into the deeper dive in the planning session for people who want to get deep into it. But we'll continue to bring it back to this larger group. So for the next two weeks, just so you know, we have, uh, as I said, a, a, a Family First uh, Prevention Act next week from our colleagues at APHSA. And then we'll have um, uh, folks from uh, Da Vinci Project the following week. And we may have one more uh, presentation uh, on the week of December 13th, I think it is, and then we'll break for Thanksgiving and maybe come back. Um, I'm saying we'll break for Thanksgiving. We'll come back for uh, maybe one or two other sessions. Uh, and then we'll be looking into uh, the beginning of next year uh, for some sessions and perhaps some series uh, of uh, some topics that we'll, we'll, uh, we'll share with you very, very soon. If you have topics, or if you have suggestions, or if you have stuff that you're doing that you want to think would be useful to highlight, of course, you know where to find us. And you should be receiving notifications um, from, uh, from our uh, capable and talented community manager, Sunday Ben Chagra, who's been um, posting all this stuff along uh, on, the, on the chat as we go forward here. So with that, I want to say uh, thanks to everybody. And we'll see you here next week. Uh, same time, same place. Have a great weekend. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Dave.